unaussprechlichen Rampe. My name is Marco Visconti, and through this podcast I will invite fellow magicians, occultists, artists, and mystics to rumble along with them and my supporters on Patreon. By doing so, I hope to introduce you all to a much wider perspective on magic and what we get nowadays from occult social media, which is frankly beginning to feel very stale, repetitive, and uninspired. If you want to be part of one of the next episodes, Join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Marco Visconti by pledging at the Yezod tier or above. And now, on with the unspeakable rumbles. Good evening, everyone, and uh, do what the will shall be the whole of the law. Welcome to episode... I knew I was going to put myself into a lot of trouble by deciding to change the the sequence. I think it's season two, episode nine, which doesn't make any sense because it should be just season, just just episode nine, really. I just decided to complicate myself a little bit. So welcome to season two, episode nine of Huno Spreklik and Ramblin. Tonight we have uh, a very, very interesting guest with us, Anna Macaro. And I, as usual, I like to introduce the guest a little bit. So this is how she describes herself. Anna lives in London and is originally from the West Country, which gave her accent and a subtle yet noticeable pirate twang, as well as a love for cream teas, stone circles, and all things mystical. Following her critically acclaimed Green Ward trilogy about a feminist and eco-pagan community of witches in Devon and Cornwall, she wrote The Daughter of Light and Shadows, an adult, adult commercial fantasy romance set in Scotland and in the Fairy Realm, followed by its sequel, The Queen of Sea and Stars. In 2019, her occult novel, The Book of Babylon, which we will talk about it a lot, was published by Black Moon Publishing. And there's so much. There's and there's so also, much in there. It's great, actually. I, I, mm-hmm. I have to say that you also published five books of poetry. And, uh, and you're, you're about to publish a book on your experience with healing, right? Yes. Yeah. So... Where do we start? <laughs> Where would you like to start, my love? All right. Um, I think that we're going to cover fundamentally two, two sections tonight, right? And this is why I wanted, I wanted you on the podcast. And one is your experience with magic and your experience with Babylon. We, we're still a telemic podcast of sorts. And then talking about your experience with healing magic with Reiki and uh, your upcoming book. Before we start to discuss the Book of Babel, I want to, to go back to March, was it March 23, 2020, which is both yesterday and 20 years ago, of course, where, where I reviewed the Book of Babel for here on Patreon. And I, I remember you contacted me because we have a friend in common, Lou Hotchkiss, uh-huh. and I remember she was talking to me about your book and then you get in touch with me and say hey would you like to read the book I was like sure absolutely Mm -hmm. thank you very much and I absolutely loved it I wrote this so the book of Babylon is a gripping tale of women adepts channeling the goddess Babylon in order to destroy a patriarchal British state that mirrored even too closely the one we live in right now it has all the right reference for those who have a background in magic as a cherry on top to the cake and in more than a couple of ways, this novel is the perfect hire to the mind-bending tales of Robert Anton Wilson and Graham Morrison, to quote just two authors that in the past, uh, that in the past wrote of actual real magic and actual real adepts. Maybe just embellishing a thing or two right there. Of course, if you want to read the full review, is on, on Patreon. Back to the Book of Babylon. So how did writing the novel impact your life? And were there any maybe unusual experiences in the process that you'd be willing to share with us tonight? Oh, right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. First of all, nice to be here. So this is the Book of Babylon. This is, as Marco said, an occult novel. Well, I think when you're a writer, your work always has an impact on your life because I certainly find with writing, it is quite a hyper sigilistic process. Mm-hmm. And I know that you guys have all discussed hyper sigils in, in a lot of detail, so that's not a new idea to you. So I find whenever you're writing, there is a there is an element of bringing into being something that wasn't there before. And for me, certainly with something like this, a degree of connecting to something 
in a meaningful way, which is what I experienced with this, with this book. Prior to writing it, I was aware of Thelema, but I didn't know anything about it. I came to this pretty cold, and mm. I came to Babylon almost completely cold. And I was thinking, in preparation for this, how did you first even come across you know, Babylon as a goddess? And I honestly can't tell you. It was kind of a process that evolved over a period of time, which I've had before, specifically when I wrote a series which involved the Morrigan, and that had a kind of similar thing in that over a period of time I developed a relationship with that so it was quite an intense book to write because of the very intense energy I suppose you might say of how one perceives Babylon if she is a goddess as it were so that was kind of how I was coming to it it was very intense energy and one of the first things that I think I encountered was I'd read The Red Goddess Peter Gray's book, which we all know, and got a couple of other things, started formulating something in my head about, and I was thinking, oh, that's really interesting, you know, kind of no stranger to red goddesses and, you know, sort of the dark feminine, and although then, you know, not technically the same, but that very intense energy before. So that I was, I was all good with that. When uh, I hadn't really started writing it, and I had some quite not odd very intense visionary experiences Mm -hmm. so one for instance was you know this happens as you're kind of mulling this over in your mind but you're not really writing it you kind of it's kind of there but it's not there you're thinking about other things and how that might be interesting within that context so one would I actually use this in the book in the one night I was having a bath and I kind of like to meditate in the bath and was just kind of doing that and I had very intense quite scary vision actually of a black snake with me in the bath really you know a big one and but I thought okay you know it's fine I'm just gonna stay with this and stay in the moment and I had the kind of experience of it coming up within me and then and then you know within me within me and then out through my mouth Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, you anyway. know, you know, you know, this is um, okay. It's interesting because you you never told me this before. Like, you told oh, me, no, right? no. it didn't come up in conversation. No. 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 It's funny because you're describing a visionary experience of that is literally part of a degree, well, a grade, or a specific. Oh, really? Doesn't matter. Of okay. of Le Coup Noir, which is one of Michael Bertio's orders, and so, the idea of being you know, being way mounted by, by the black snake. <laughs> and the black snake does have some sort of mm. loose connection with Babylon. So I know, I know, and it's not, and I know that in saying so, that um, it's not a kind of traditionally Babylonian reference, that experience, although that's an interesting t- thing to know about the order of the black snake. Oh, but then, um, then again, if I may say, they're, but, they're, they're not really like traditional Babylonian experience, right? Because Babylon is is yeah. something we know awfully little yet yeah, yeah. It, it, it's an energy it's an egregore it's a goddess so all these various things i think they're all the same but it's also mm. different layers right and they we, we don't know much about babylon you know <laughs> it's really mm. so maybe maybe like you are the one uh-huh. down the first you know visionary experiences um, well I'm not sure about that, but it's interesting, isn't it? And it, to me, it felt, I suppose I didn't know enough at the time to know whether that was kosher or not, but it resonated with the energy that mm-hmm. I was surrounding myself in at the time. And it was a very kind of sexual thing, yeah. but also it's that it's sexual, but it's, you know, it's scary at the same time, but also kind of transformational. So oh, there was that. Well, uh, we, start, we, started, we started with a bang already. Yeah. Right? Well, thank you. It's great. Stop, you need oh. to go on, Marco. And I would say, I put my lipstick on. Guess what my lipstick's called? Orgasm. Well, there you go. Perfect. Yeah. It okay. is perfect. I get, to, uh, I get to 10 points for saying orgasm within 15 minutes. I, I think you do. I hope we're not going to get, you know, kicked out of Spotify or anything like that. I mean, <laughs> they keep Joe Rogan. It's okay. We're going to be fine, I suppose. There's one question from Gemma here. When do you write? Do you find uh-huh. yourself embedded within within it to the point that the life mirrors or magnetize aspects of the story back to you? Like that does in many ways, like it, does it become a yeah. true life or sigil for you, right? Yeah, or- yeah. So I'd started off on that tack and then I got distracted, didn't I? So yes, 
really, because, I mean, ultimately, it has proved the old, not an ultimate hyper sigil, but it has, for instance, led me here to this group. Mm -hmm. So that's quite an interesting development over a period of time. I mean, that's taken, well, I mean, I, I was writing this for about three to four years before it came out, by the way, which oh, wow. is an intensely huge amount of time, yeah. bearing in mind that I usually crack out a book of my sort of women's fiction one in about four months. So it was... How really do you do exactly? Because <laughs> as you know, I'm writing a book right now and I'm like yeah. banging my head at the walls. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's, sorry. Well, it's practice. But it, and it depends what you're doing, I think, because if you have something that's quite, I don't want to say formulaic, but quite formulaic. So once you get the hang of that, it makes it easier. Whereas something like this was different. It still has a fictional, you know, it still has a shape that most novels might have, broadly speaking, and a structure. But it's not like you can say, OK, well, it's got these really familiar tropes in it and it mm -hmm. needs this and it needs that. Although occult fiction has got its own features there, there is, which is a whole there, other yeah. area yeah there's, anyway. definitely, there's definitely some beats you have to to get yeah. into yeah i think i I, put, I find occult fiction fascinating i really um love do it. you have a do you have a favorite occult fiction uh title? yeah i do but you're gonna hate me well go for it go for it <laughs> so well when the first first i think ever book that brought me into witchcraft was uh, The Sea Priestess by Dion Fortune. Oh, I love it. I love The Unfortune. I love The Unfortune. I love The Unfortune as a, as a novel writer. Mm. I hate, I don't like, I don't rate her anymore as a, you know, as a, as an occult teacher. But okay. I think, I think her, her novels are fascinating to be fair. All of them, you know, The Sea Priestess, the Moon Magic, The Goatfoot God. I mean, they really are, I mean, they they are great because they embed real magic into it, right? Mm. I do think that the unfortunate is very outdated, and I do think that there, some of our views are really problematic in this day and age. And we discussed it recently when I did the live stream about you know being hexed, being cursed, and the fact mm. that every, everything goes back to psychic self defense, which is oh, right. oh, yeah. as good as a door stopper, if you ask me. <laughs> you mm. get the book, you, you can do it's, it blocks doors. That's good. So people don't enter. Maybe that's psychic self defense. Anyway, hot takes. Uh, what, what, wait, <laughs> you, 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 you did orgasm in 15 minutes. I did my first hot take in 20. That's fine. It's oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> We're well good. done. We're good to go. Okay. So, so yes, Back, back to yeah. the hyper sigil. The, 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 did writing this book put yes. you in a hyper sigil? Yes. So, yeah, sorry, keep going off to point. Yes. Yeah, so, it uh, brought me to this group. And I think more generally, also, it's, it's a very strong book, right? So, it's uh, full of sex, feminism, the occult, blah, blah. blah. It's about, it has a, a story about this group of women who are within this quite political organization called Babylon. They kind of take it into a political arena as an activist group and that they are fighting for reproductive rights in this future UK where the government has gone, hmm, let's debate the abortion laws, you know, it, as they are um, doing in America. So there's a lot of very strong themes in it, and it's it's not a gentle book in any way. And no, I, it, absolutely but, not. There's, no. there's some strong <laughs> scenes as well, <laughs> to be fair. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it comes with all the warning, but it very much followed me through quite an intense period in my life. So I don't think, from that point of view, I don't think it's a hyper sigil as it, it didn't then make more intense things happen, mm -hmm. but it, it very much reflected. Uh, what, what, what was that? A, a lot of very big stuff that was happening for me at the time and also uh, part of the reason it took me so long to write was trying to work out the kind of the politics and the feminism side of it which I'm not totally convinced that I managed to if I'm honest as well because it's such a thorny area and I was thinking so much about bioessentialist feminism and where does that sit with witchcraft and where does it sit in the world today and how is this inclusive and can it be inclusive and blah 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 other yeah, stuff yeah. so that was all interesting in terms of then being a hyper sigil i don't know i think it's just ultimately connected me to this 93 current more than anything and in a funny kind of way in that I, as i say i came to um her it's quite cold and it, i've almost kind of found mapped my own way here with it mm -hmm if that makes sense. If you were to write about the Book of Babylon now, are there any aspects that would be different as a result of your deepening journey with Telema? Mm. Yeah, I was thinking about this. I don't really know what the answer is. Probably, yeah. 
probably because um at the point of starting that that was i probably started it in 2016 maybe that's quite a long time ago now and quite apart from anything you know apart from the things that i now know that i didn't know before or the context that i might see things in which would be a bit different but i'm different myself as a person as well and things maybe have moved on i think the one thing that i probably wouldn't do is the book is told by three different narrators which is i I probably still do that because i wanted to show various three different women's encounters with babylon and how it how the whole thing affected them in different ways the women at different stages of their life it's very much a book about women there yeah. are no male characters in it virtually i mean they are but they're kind of in, they're, they're kind of bit parts mm-hmm. the biggest male character in it is jack crowley yeah. a, a badly disguised jack parsons um but he's not really in it in it he's just kind of there in the, in the past at one point but one but the thing that i did in my own mind with those three characters is i made <laughs> you get to say this is mm, mark i hate that i made them uh, made mother and crone in my mind which i know now is completely irrelevant to this whole thing yeah to me to me it helped me because i thought let's have a younger woman a middle-aged woman and an old woman sort of encountering babylon and how does that transform them in different ways because of the different stages of their life so i think that's still valid but i think i wouldn't probably as yeah I get it. obviously reference that that would be my main thing the rest i don't know but you know what you mentioned that the triple goddess formula of witchcraft was something that i don't know if it really adheres to to the concept of babylon at all right because no, I don't think first of all as you know as everybody know by now even that idea comes from the 50s and i don't know yeah i don't know if it was Aidan kelly it was one of these it was the farers i don't remember who did but like it was the first that kind of inferred this this big idea of these three phases of a woman i almost like i don't know i always found it very I don't know, very anti-feminist actually, because to me, you know, as a male, cis male, hetero male, I always felt that what about, but the women can only be these three things. They can, what about a woman doesn't want to be a mother, right? What about, and I mean, I know, I know myself a lot of women that just never had the, the mother aspect and they don't care. So it's like, well, what, we don't have a face? <laughs> I mean, this is what, that's what some people told me, right? And, I, and when it comes to bubble on it, I feel, you know, Babylon's so alien to, to this classic ideas that she's really somewhere else entirely. I do, I mean, as as you know, I, I've been starting to write, uh, and it will take forever, about this concept of Babylon the Red and Babylon the Black, whereby Babylon the Red is the red goddess of Peter Gray, which, and it's the, you know, the goddess witchcraft of Jack Parsons. It's it's the Scarlet Woman, right? The mm. one that then, then, get, then becomes... Um, embodied into an earthly avatar however the scarlet woman to me it's a it's a downward fractalization of babylon as being as understanding as the blackness because of course the blackness of babylon is the blackness of nuit so it, it's of course i'm rambling here but hey uh, you come here for the rambles uh-huh. and, uh, and that's so one question since i ent- entered the, the the realm of the scarlet woman and this is yeah. from gem as well is there a, any particular woman that held the office of Scarlet Woman in the flesh mm. that you are particularly intrigued by? Mm. Yeah, this is such a great question. I would like to know more about all of them. Crowley's women, to start with, because I know some, you know, I know that something about Leah Hersick and some of his other wives and partners, but don't know as much as I might. And I think it's a really fascinating area. And in fact, Manon Hedenborg White did a really good, that's, you know, Manon's book, The Eloquent Ballad, which is Babylon and Femininities, which is, that was her PhD thesis. It's amazing if you haven't read it. The Goddess Babylon and the Construction of Femininities in Western Esotericism. Anyway, she did a really good Instagram series on Crowley's Women a while back. You'll be happy to know that she's about to release, you'll be happy to know she's about to release a book with Camaret Press called, called The Women of Telema. And that's exactly that. She's, yeah. going to, she's expanding on each of the Scarlet Woman, each of the women that actually took the role in the flesh. Oh, oh amazing. Because, I mean, even the, the small amount of info that she was putting up a while ago was fascinating. And again, it's, you know, we hear so little from women in the history of the occult, and we know so little about them comparatively. 
to yeah. amend that we really need more scholarship and more books and more inquiry about them i would say probably of all because of this marjorie cameron is probably my fave in terms of i find her fascinating she is she was a fascinating woman and i wish again we had more about her we have some things we had a biography spencer cancer's mm. book which is interesting and there's her lovely songs of the witch woman yeah which is from Fulga press which is a collection of her art jack's poems so, i can't remember now there's some of her writing in there as well I think that's right. There's someone, someone that yeah. I would like to, 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 to invite at some point, if I can convince him, is Clive Harper. Clive Harper knew Cameron. Oh, and, really? And, uh, and he, he definitely has, he told me some interesting story about it. She was, she was an insanely complex person. Yeah, but absolutely. I can very fascinating one, fascinating one from what I hear from Clive. Yeah. So, yeah, the thing is that, like, for, for there, there are some, you know, Cameron is, is definitely an amazing, I mean, if you think about it, she was a Hollywood actress, like, she is in movies with Dennis Hopper. I don't remember the title of the movie right now, but it's like this movie. She's in the, the inauguration of the Pleasure Dome. Oh, yeah, she's, she's in the Kenneth Anger movie. I mean, I don't but, think she really acts in it, she just stands there. Well, I mean, nobody really acts, weird. nobody really acts in, in Kenneth Anger movies. <laughs> it, yeah. It's not a stand to stand and look, look pretty, pretty much, but no, she actually acts in um, this, this movie, with the, one of the first movies with Dennis Hopper, and I, I don't remember the title right now, unfortunately. You can find it on YouTube for free, actually. I'll put so everybody can do it. And she was like a full-blown movie star. I mean, she, she didn't act in many movies because then she started, you know, her own cult, and that didn't go very well. And then, uh, and then she was like, very, she, apparently she was a very difficult person to deal with. I can um, imagine, yeah. For me, you know, when it, if I think of the ones that took the, the office of the Scarlet One with Crowley, I think that my the most fascinating for me is um, Hilarion because she was, she was like first of all this rich socialite from the United States, Jen Foster's, and uh, and and she was the one that uh, pretty much at some point Crowley was like, "Yo, come with me," and she was like. No, I'm bye. Uh, I had enough. I played. I'm happy. Bye. <laughs> and Crowley was distraught for like, oh no, the the love of my life has gone forever. And she was like, no, nah, bye. I don't care. <laughs> she she really seems like she was a, but she was, she was absolutely stunning. I colorized one of her picture, and she is a beauty. It seems like she was a very very str strong willed character and we know awfully little about her if i'm not mistaken she actually and i'm i think i'm right here she was actually very good friend with what's it called yates father and they're buried together like nearby in the same plot it's 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 an interesting 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 story yes the the maybe yates you mean so yeah, yeah 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 absolutely yeah all right so anyway, yeah, I I I really looking forward for you know Dr. White's next book because I think we need this. Like we need we need to hear more about mm. this because if you think about it, like from a dynamic standpoint, if they were the avatar of Babylon, right, or of the Scarlet Woman, right, of Babylon the Red, well, I mean, they must have held, held quite the power. And there's some of them. If you think about it, Lair Hirsig, Rachel Ostrel, she was insanely dedicated to, to magic itself even after crowley left there well quite uh, and then yeah. he, he told her she couldn't be it anymore and yeah. she was you know was pretty upset about that i mean it's interesting isn't it because in this day and age i i'm presuming she you know she didn't need to be she would have just gone on and carried on you know and yeah. not not even but thought oh he has to tell me if i can do it or not then it's a very different time but you know it, it's interesting because with, with alostrel like she actually did quite a power play at some point because in 1925 when they did like the veda conference where they where basically crowley took the mantle of the leader worldwide of the oto um alostrel as an older and like senior member gave her gave her like her you know like she she agreed to the nomination and then a few years later she retracted the nomination so, so she's like she was like yeah no you know what uh fuck you girly so <laughs> i i really like that yeah oh, by the way, uh, yeah the i movie... think she had backbone yeah for sure or oh, she definitely had well she definitely had something of good luck the weird shit that they did i mean she was a dedicated but also a very strong character i presume i mean absolutely we, we have we have a lot um if any we cannot we cannot really read, read leah, Sub leah subraheim here because it's uh there's a lot of scat references in it mm. and maybe it's not for <laughs> spotify is gonna kick us out maybe yeah, yeah. It's YouTube, but uh, if you're curious do read leah subraheim because it's uh it's an interesting and in very interesting poem between whatever crowley and Elastro were up to in Chevalu. 
By the way, the movie with Cameron, it's called Night Tide, with the one where she starts with Danny Sopper, and uh, it's apparently it's on Amazon Prime here in the UK. Oh, wow. I, 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 remem I remember it was for free on YouTube as well, but anyway, uh, you can go and watch it. And this is where she's a very interesting character. I was going to say, on, sorry, on that Scarlet Women front, Marco, you'll know this, Crowley at one point did a, a ri well, it's not a ritual, it's initiation, but I don't know which one it is, you will know. He went to, he did it in America, I think, and he had all of the, lots of different women, and they all in, inhabited the spirit of a different animal. Yes. And he had sex with them in different ways, and that was all part of his kind of meeting the... Uh, mm. It's very kind of shamanic, really, we would see it in those terms. I mean, he used to have, like, uh, Ilarion was the cat, Alostra was the, well, the, the ape. So well, it, it, yeah, was, like, yeah. he, he was really giving. So he, he definitely used to give her, uh, give, give different, but that, that was, I think that was Crowley being Crowley, to be fair. It was Crowley yeah. trying to, I don't, I don't know if maybe we get infirmary with some sort of like weird power play on his part as well. I would not be I, would, I was just wondering mm -hmm. about it, what you thought about it, because I read about it and thought, well, that's weird. I mean, but as <laughs> so many things he did, I mean, you can kind of see like where he was going. I did think that seems in a way, you know, he's trying to encounter animal, sort of essential animal spirits in different ways by having sex with it. That's like his answer for everything, isn't it? I, th I, think mm, I wish to know something, I will have sex with it. You know what, um, I think that in his diaries, it, there's parts where he, he says that it, it was more about like the kind of the vibe that each Scarlet Woman was giving, right? So, yeah. you know, for instance, like, like Hilarion was like a cat because she was like beautiful but elusive and she, you could never catch her pretty much. And that, that, that was the same for, for, for each one of us. But it, could, it could, well, could well be as well that it was some sort of like weird shamanic-like yeah. approach to... Kind to of, in not so many words. I just thought, well, that's weirdly fascinating on the Scarlet Woman front. And also completely reductive of them as, you know, human beings and women. Because anyway, but you know, it's another time. I mean, you know, I'll tell you though something that Curly was. I feel that Curly was reductive of everybody as mm. a being, right? At the same time, if you, we know a lot of his relationship with Alostril, with Larry Ersig, and he was there. There's there's a lot of poetry he wrote about her as a almost like an exalted being, and their relationship was you know, dom sub, whereby he was the sub. I was and gonna he say, really, exactly, really, yeah. Like, he would really let her do him, anything to him, pretty much. So, it, 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 it's it, clearly, you know, it, it's very <laughs> easy for us to think of him yes. as, you know, as a chauvinistic pig, he, and he was a lot of the times, but he, he, he was much more than that, to be fair. Like, he, yeah, was, yeah. he was honestly a very complex and layered character. So. I know, I know. I was thinking about that, funnily enough, about him and Leah particularly and their relationship, and I did think exactly it seems like a classic Dom sub situation, and he is the sub here. But what's... And on one hand, you can say, oh, but, you know, he, she had very much had the powerful position in that relationship. Well, yes, she does, but that time, when you're the dominant person in that situation if you're doing it like as a sex thing or just generally in life so much energy has to come from you to enable the mm -hmm. submissiveness of the other person so yeah. actually it's really not it's not as empowering as all that there's a kind of a i still feel like as an energy transfer between them he was the one doing all the demanding. I'm not Absolutely. saying she, she wasn't doing what she was wanting to do or anything, but do you know what I, I mean by that? You know, in BDSM, the, the, they say that it's the sub that's always in control, and it's true. Yeah. And no, you know, okay. like like back back when I was young and working in uh, fetish, I can tell you that if you take the role of a dom or a master, or whatever, you are the one expending more energy. You're doing all the work. Yeah, you're absolutely like yeah. it, it, because it's it's especially you know if it's twenty four seven, if it's what we used to call like TPE, total power exchange relationships. Mm -hmm. It's so it's a situation where like you you have to give constantly, and the other person is the receiver. Yes, maybe they they are the ones that go through maybe. 
yeah, if it's a sadist relationship, actually on physical pain, or maybe like psychological pain, or maybe humiliation, all these things happen, right? And Crowley really wanted all of that, by the way, he wanted the yeah. humiliation, he wanted the physical pain, but he was the center, like the sub or the slave is the center point of the relationship. It's almost like the 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 god or goddesses of, of the relationship. It's all about the sub, it's all about the, the, the slave, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. So, in many ways, you're right, like uh, Crowley, Crowley, <laughs> Crowley was found a way you know, to, to power bottom the situation as we <laughs> as we used to say <laughs> so yes on yes. that note do you have a favorite fairy tale <laughs> let's move on to a related subject yes i do and in fact i have some here not that it will be of any help to people listening i think my absolute favorite is the snow queen that's okay. a copy of it there <laughs> i see Gemma nodding do you like that as well? That's just a really pretty version of it. I think that's my ultimate favourite, which is the story I, about... I, I, I don't you know, know that I don't, one? I don't it's know. a little girl and a little boy, and um, they're the best of friends. And then one day, it's uh, it's winter, and the little boy, Kai, gets a piece of ice in his eye, and it, it kind of and then it makes its way down to his heart, and it turns him from a lovely, loving boy into a cold, remorseless boy oh jessica loves it too and he gets taken away by the snow queen to go and live in her snowy kingdom when where there is you know it's kind of lovely beautiful but cold and his his friend gerda has to go and rescue him which she does okay 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 yeah I that's will... my day is there is there any power bottom situation in it you know well she's the ultimate she's the ultimate dom is the snow queen you, you know <laughs> like all of those characters in fairy tale the ultimate all-powerful queen you know very okay. one-dimensional well, well, and very it's... powerful but very evil and cold yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, but yeah and then i have this is i'm holding up a copy of this is a, a book from my childhood stories from Grimm. and i still have it and i love it mostly because of the illustrations in it which are just the people listening can't see, but they're very beautiful. Is it, they're is very it? beautiful. We, we can see them. <laughs> oh, on that note, I would like to say, if you want to see them, you can join us on Patreon. So join you can actually Patreon. see the art. What's that one? You can't really see them here, but it's just one of the... You know, fairy tales often come with amazing illustrations. This isn't Arthur Rackham. This is somebody else, but they often do. Anyway, one of my favourite story in that was one called One Eye, Two Eye and Three Eyes, which is a really, really quite obscure... There's so many obscure fairy tales, aren't there? They're like, we know quite a lot of the famous ones, but we forget the rest. And that's about similar, like, moral to the story that most of them has. There's three ch three sisters. One has one eye, one has two eyes, one has three eyes. And two eyes is the good one, and the other two are the bad ones. And um, they, they get set a series of tasks to do by a mysterious old lady in the woods. It's another power bottom situation. Got it. Okay. That, that, <laughs> this is the theme of the night. I, I get it. Please um, don't caption my video power bottom. Oh. I mean, if anything, that's the opposite of what I am. No, no, no. We're gonna, we, we're gonna, we're gonna definitely gonna call it BDSM something. It's, it's important. <laughs> Even if we didn't really, it's it's fun. It's it, okay, actually it's gonna so be it's, it's gonna be very good for uh, for YouTube. Perfect. We're gonna change subject now. We're Let's, gonna change, we're gonna change chapter. Yes. We're gonna leave all the naughtiness behind. Mm -hmm. and in fact, we are we're moving from the black and the red, and we enter the realm of the white. You are also mm -hmm. a Reiki practitioner and a, an energy healer. And uh, this is this this is a very good question from Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. And I'm just gonna read it because it's uh, it's gonna set up the, the the next part of the of this little chat. Kelly is asking, as a Reiki practitioner and having a Western occult practice, do you do anything to mix the two, or are they completely separate practices? The system of Reiki is actually pretty contemporary, but like the lemma, it existed before Dr. Mikao Usui received instruction on how to perform it, and it, based, it is based on Eastern concepts. Kelly says, as a Reiki master myself, I've been formulating how I want to go about my practice while integrating my Thelemic beliefs into it, because that is true to what I am. And there is a lot of overlap in all the systems and understanding how they work and, their, and, 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 and understanding their history is also very important. But some people in the woo world 
think, uh, would think of their wives and that they shouldn't mix. You know, the classic people that know things, uh, don't, don't mix the streams pretty much. Uh, that's Ghostbuster. Anyway. Do you, so the question is, got to the question. Mm -hmm. Do you find that when you're doing Reiki, you have your Reiki hat on and when you're doing other practices, you have, you have your witch hat on or do they mingle? Mm -hmm. This this is a really good thing to ponder, isn't it, about mixing techniques or should one do it and things. I personally, yes, do do it. There's the, that's the really quick answer to that. I don't, certainly where the Reiki is concerned anyway, I don't think there is a problem in using it in uh, non-traditional contexts, you might say, as long as it feels right to you. I wouldn't use it with everything, but there are lots of things that I do use it for in a kind of a more witchy context so anything that would involve energetically charging anything anything that would involve protection so energy protecting mm -hmm. uh, your house or your car or whatever anything that would involve putting energy towards an, an outcome i know you're, we're not outcomes focused in this group in in the in like an ordinary way but that definitely works nonetheless so i personally don't have a problem with that i the way i was taught reiki was actually quite quite magical really when i think about it they weren't doing it in in the name of magic or anything but i was taught how to use it to cleanse space how to enchant different areas in your house basically so every time you walk through it you're energized i was what else was i taught how to do with it loads of stuff really that aren't I think the thing is with Reiki is people think it is just about healing people on a, on a bed, you know, like an alternative therapy, which it absolutely is, of course, the most common usage. But because you have the ability to send back in time, forward in time, across space and time, then it obviously really does lend itself to what you might think of more magical operations. Mm -hmm. So... It has, I don't know if everybody listening or if everybody watching really knows what it is. I mean, it's... Yeah, can you, can you tell us a little bit? So I'll tell you in a nutshell. It, so it's a, it's a Japanese system. It was given to this guy called Dr. Mikao Yusui. He went on, he was already kind of a spiritual teacher and a Buddhist. He went up to sit on the top of a mountain one day and he was given the symbols he kind of received them as a mystical experience and given the kind of the teachings of Reiki, if you like. And then he went down and he talked that he gave the symbols to a few people that he knew and they started teaching it to other people. So, and it was always intended as a kind of a gift to humanity from the powers that be and it was intended to be shared far and wide. And it was so it, it and it itself is an energy healing technique whereby I as the practitioner or you as the practitioner channel uh, universal energy through you. So when I give you a treatment, say, I'm not giving you my energy. Sometimes people will say, oh, don't you get really tired doing it? I don't. Actually, it's really energizing because it comes through me. It's not mine. So you are a channel, if you like. The way that you do it is that you receive attunements from the Reiki master or your, your, the person giving it to you so they basically they do a little procedure wherein they put the symbols into your aura your energy body and so you have a bit of a ceremony with it and then there's three levels you get the first level and you're then able to give reiki to yourself and other people second level you are then taught three of the four symbols that exist and at the master level you're given the final master symbol to use and each symbol so there's four symbols I think there, I mean, I know there have been developments in Reiki. People have come up with new symbols and like, you know, offshoots and stuff like that. But the classic system has got four symbols in it. The first one, Chokurei, is what we call like the power symbol. Oh, God, I can't remember the... Uh, I'm doing it on, on, on Translation. Screen. So the translation is Chokurei, place the power of the universe here. So that's the first one. And you would use that, you could use it for anything, but it's like you kind of taught that it's particularly great for healing the physical body or adding power to anything. But uh, I was always taught like, do that first. And then you have Say Hey Ki, which is your emotional, mental healing. And that is kind of translated as like God and man become one or earth and sky meet. It's hard, yeah, I kind of I have a feeling about all of them, but which is hard to describe. Then you have the one which enables you to send Reiki to somebody who's not with you. 
or send it to the past, send it to the future, or do things like set it up in your house to run at 10 p.m. on every Tuesday or something like that, because it's outside space and time, which is quite interesting, I think, for us. And so it's like a little formula. They're all formulas, yeah. aren't they? That enables yeah. you to use raking a slightly different way. And then you have the master symbol, dichomio, which is, and it's like energy when it comes through. So, and when all you have to do once you have been attuned is trace these symbols or you can breathe them. I sometimes I'm walking along and I will breathe them into the air in front of me because I don't want to be doing this as I'm walking along look like a weirdo. Or you can... You can, you something something that window. something that I, that I that I that I used to do. I I mean I I've done the the the, the three degrees as well many years ago, twenty years ago to be fair, twenty thousand two. Yes, twenty years ago. And something that I that I that I've done it right is that like I imagine like how do you say like uh, how do you say that in English when you when you have one of these new cars that you have like on, on the on the on the window you you can also have like i don't know how fast you go and things like that i don't know yeah had uh, had this had the display something like that i don't know yeah but basically that's that's the way i see them like almost like boom they, they appear in front of me mm -hmm. and they stay in front of me in my aura pretty much mm -hmm. so instead of chat you know instead of like tracing them if i go around and uh, i need to bring them back i can just like boom, put them in front of my yeah. ad display if you want like in front yeah. of my eyes I know what you mean yeah I mean I think once you're used to them and they're integrated into your energy field as it were and how that happens is you're giving them the achievement and then you just use it a load and you kind of get it going if you like yeah. then you, yeah you can be really creative with it and you know you know when it's happening because you feel it and but, there's but no so at the end of the day, like Kelly was asking, like, do do you do you mix them then? So you, you yeah. use like which practices, um, dynamic practices, and Reiki because yeah, I, th I think there are some things that I would do. I wouldn't necessarily mix everything. It's not always appropriate. Why, so why, 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 why do you, what, yeah? What do you say appropriate? That's an interesting term. Why do you why do you, why would you use? That? I don't mean right or wrong or anything. It's just whether. The, so for instance, if we're doing, if I was doing like I was practicing Lieber Vel regularly today out in the garden, I haven't yet tried to do that with Reiki at the same time, partly because that seems way too confusing. Like, if you think that's confusing, wait wait till you get to Liber Samic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm good for now. You know, partly because I'm, I'm super concentrating on that. I don't think, you know, I could, I could bring through that energy and then use it within that ritual context. I haven't, yeah, why isn't that appropriate? I don't know, I think if I felt it was, I would. I feel like with those thelemic rituals, it's, I don't want to, well, that sounds wrong, muddy the water. At this stage, I don't want to combine them personally, but I think, I mean, you could do. I mean, the icomio, particularly like the master symbol energy, when it comes through, and I think after a while, you can kind of feel the differences between, or I can feel the differences between the different symbol energies. It's a really intense for me, god energy not god i don't know what god is yeah. god is probably you know terrible but it's very intense high vibrational energy for want of a better word very like it sounds really embarrassing rainbowy you know because I, that's how i experience it and i'm not a very rainbowy person but that's so if i and i do feel it is quite intrinsically magical and i think if i were doing a ritual particularly with a i wanted it to be really outcomes focused where whereas something like the regularly or the star review or whatever so is it's not particularly on an outcome like yeah, i want to yeah. you know get this job or something it's not about that at all then i might use that and direct it towards that thing and say you know i would like this thing or something better for my for my own highest will and good you know because that, that's what i'm yeah, but at the same time, you, you could use Reiki in order to center yourself mm -hmm. and make make sure that the flow of energy of if, you know from of a theurgic ritual like of a like a Starubi or or Reguli uh, or even others rituals like even Samic or the Star Sapphire like you could actually use it in order to maybe like be the, your best self as you engage with theurgy. Yeah, so, I think one thing you could certainly do is uh, send it in advance to your space. 
So yeah. as part of setting up your space to empower that, you know, mm -hmm. your circle, your space, blah, 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 and then go into it and then do your whole thing. So then you're not worrying about, I'm going to do this now and I'm going to sort of channel it with my hands. Well, I can't do that because I'm yeah, doing, you're doing other, other things, things with my hands and what have you. But I think that would be a, a really interesting thing to do. Because the thing with Reiki is you can't go wrong with it. There's no, yeah. there's no, once it comes in, there is nothing else there in terms yeah. of there's no bad things. You know, no, or there's, there's, you know, it just eliminates everything else. So no, that's you know, not what you want, mind you. Because I, you know, from from my understanding, is that Reiki is what the Theosophist or even the Golden Dawn and Crow used to call the astral light. I mean, that's exactly the same type of energy it's the kind of you know like the energy you call down when you do the middle pillar energy i mm -hmm. mean that's that's i would say that i mean my understanding I, i'm pretty sure that there will be people listening to this going mad about it but that is reiki because that is the, the, the you know the god energy pretty much like that it, that comes down the god it's the it's the the blueprint almost like the, the blueprint energy of creation that you become a channel like of of the fire from heaven really of course it's not it's not fire because the rake even if i think it can be as you said it can be very empowering and very present but there's a gentleness to to, to reiki and i think that the gentleness it's colored by the symbols like you you say that like the symbols are formula for magical formula pretty mm. much they mm. have they have you know they have a sigil they have a seal mm. they they and they have like a name which is a formula well i mean it's almost like using the seals give a specific characteristic to the energy to yeah that's a flavor right? to them mm. and and maybe you know some sort of like maybe more fiery more more destructive nature of that energy it's it's mellowed down in order to become maybe more palatable to the average person because you know the, the, you 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 give this to everybody and everybody feels good about it well yeah. by or by if you know if you give somebody i don't know you you you, you give somebody I, I mean, I've, I've seen it happen like to do the middle pillar it's it, the telemic middle pillar maybe it's some people was like wow this is what this was powerful but like maybe also not scary but it was like i wasn't expecting it was very fiery it was very uh, really like it, it, strong right mm. um, that's interesting i think the other thing about i don't think this is limited to reiki but often people when they experience energy in that quite uh, concentrated way and in, in that way that you're talking about in this or healing in another form it can though quite be a traumatic experience and it's not always love and light. And that's not because, from the point of view of Reiki anyway, that the energy isn't love and light. The energy is always what it is. But quite often, when people come to it the first time or quite soon, they will have, they will cry. They will feel, they may feel really hot or really cold. They may have, they will likely have an old memory come up, maybe something traumatic. And they might be like, oh God, this is horrible. But it, it's, it's the um that's part of the healing process yeah absolutely. And actually that's just you know everything being moved out or around um, on that note since you spoke of healing right you're writing a book about healing now so what I can am. you tell us about that okay so so in terms of being a practitioner i'm a reiki master and that's my thing but over the years i have experienced lots and lots of different healing modalities as a client because because I have, because <laughs> I just went and, and did a lot of it because I felt called to do so and I had things that I felt needed healing in my life. So over the years, I've tried lots of different things and some I've really liked and were really profound. And I can't think of anything that I really hate. Oh no, gong baths. I really fucking hated that gong bath. You really? Yeah. I love, I love gong baths. Ugh. Oh no, I, I, I absolutely love gong baths. <laughs> I no, a bad one. <laughs> oh, I, I disagree. I, the gong bats are amazing. Uh, no, uh, I know they are. I had just a bad experience and I went into work the next day and I said to my boss, oh, I had this gong bath. It was awful. She went, oh, she went, don't tell me about it. It makes everyone furious. <laughs> I was like, okay. I was really furious. Anyway, wait, it probably opened up my throat chakra and let all my fury out. Oh, like that. Anyway, I I'm sure they're great. Anyway, everything else. I really liked but it's all very all very different some of it like very hardcore kind of breath work I don't know if you know what that is which is accelerated breathing technique really aimed at moving out trauma in a really it really fast I mean it's incredible but it's um yeah, it can yeah. be very it can be very intense yeah it's okay. intense from that to Reiki to what else do I write about 
past life regression, which is not really healing, but it kind of had a healing element to it. And body talk, which is something that I still have, which is a, a really interesting technique, which is kind of based on biofeedback, partly talk therapy, partly intuitive on the part of the practitioner. Okay. And it's really, really interesting. Anyway, so I kind of talk about my experiences with all of them over the years and what was going on in my life at the time and how it's helped and interview some practitioners as well of all of those things. So that is the book. Uh, when when yeah. is coming out? September Ooh. this year, 2022. All right. So a little um... while to go. But yeah, it's been a really interesting process because it's enabled me to reflect back on my healing journey without sounding too naff about that but for I think you know it's one funny, of my no, no, sorry no, no, now that you say that I am going to possibly use it in a clip <laughs> what your healing journey it's I'm reflecting on my healing journey <laughs> exactly um but I, I'm really passionate about healing actually and from a number of points of view partly because I think everyone needs it you can't be human and not have you not need healing not and most people don't have it because they think it's bollocks or they don't think they need it or they think they can think themselves through everything you know use this thing which isn't really true so i think that first and i think having had so bloody much of it i kind of like a, i can attest how good it is and i would be dead if i hadn't had it oh, so yeah. dead to be dead so i think it's really important but also apart from just for everybody because we're humans living life and life really just seems to exist to put us in traumatic situations but i think as magical practitioners it's really important so this is yeah. one of my things is that i think you need to do or the more healing you do the perhaps the better a practitioner you are or that they go or there's my west country accent or or more perhaps more realistically that they are um always connected in a loop yeah. like going round and round so you know, like solve about, a coagula right I mean, if, if you think about it one of Ma magic's original goals was healing right and and even considering the idea of healing the the human nature from its human nature and like a rediscovery of godhood that can be seen you know that that alchemical transmutation is healing itself it's healing of healing the impurities the imperfection of, exactly. of, the, human, of the human experience mm. and you never we're never going to become perfect that we'll never get to the stage but me making a say we'll never become perfect we will and we will probably never come to a point where we don't need it because stuff keeps happening it will always yeah. happen but I think there's something in that relationship and a flowing relationship between between healing, coming to terms with the things that are presented to you, integrating them within yourself, not forgetting that they happened, not trying to, you know, move past this never happened. It's not about that, is it? It's about breathing it in, taking yeah, it in, integrating absolutely. it, moving on. But being able to do that and being strong enough to do that, sometimes we need help help to do that exactly jonathan says all about integration it, it, you know, but then I, being being so integrated and sort of taking on the experiences that this earthly plane has to offer mother malkuth the experience of malkuth let's be, let's all you know have it then surely that makes us better more grounded magicians you need to have those, those yeah. foundation and the, the foundation is you can't a, be you can't be easily um pushed over you yeah. know i think or you can be pushed over, but you just need to have him have the knowledge of how to get back up again. You know, I suppose that's it, isn't it? You could not get sucked into the oh, I'm so strong, I'm so healed, and, uh, yeah, and, nothing and, and, can touch me, everything yeah. can fucking touch you all the time. That's not the point. It's about. I mean, I, I think that you know, part of the healing process is also becoming like strengthening yourself, strengthening your body. Like, like you know, if you. If you if you're very healthy, I mean it's it's because you take care of yourself. Well, that is you take you take care of your healing patterns already. And so mm -hmm. I I don't think I mean I don't believe that one unassailable all the time, but I think that one can become much more resilient and much more it's mm -hmm. resilient. Obviously, it's the it's the term of of the pandemic. So we all know yeah. we all learn about being resilient. Yeah, we do, we do. And it's, uh, um... I have one final question for you tonight, mm -hmm. and we're gonna try and keep it concise okay sorry 
no like i i gave you the, the chance to ramble and you did and i did I ran with it. it's beautiful it's great <laughs> this is called unspeakable rambles after all so if you were a spirit what correspondences libation of materia magica would we need <laughs> would we need to summon you oh god oh yeah I mean, I know mine, and I shared with this on Discord today. I'm not going to repeat it. No. Uh, but you, what's yours? It, it, can can we say it? On, on... I'm sure we can. Oh, this is it's such a funny question, isn't it? I think mine would probably be there would be music involved. You would have to have stirring music of some kind. You would have to have when this question was asked. I thought basically, what has to happen is there has to be four naked men, uh, you know. Uh, making up the quarters. <laughs> they have to be attractive. They have to summon me while the stirring music plays, possibly like holding out some some champagne and chocolates. All right, all right. Well, yeah. that sounds uh, absolutely... <laughs> That's good. That's good. I can see that. I can see that. <laughs> Anna, thank you so much for being with us oh, tonight. Thank you for where, can, me. where can we find you online? You can find me at annamacero.com is my website. I'm on Instagram as well, Anna Macero. Perfect. Easy. As usual, I will leave all the links in the description below on Spotify, etc., etc. Thank you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for the fantastic ramble. Oh, and thank you. thank you all for being uh, on yet another chapter of the unspeakable rambles. And I will see you all pretty soon. Do what the will shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love and the will. Good night.